a decision. So, and that's, I guess, more a soci sociology question, more than a, uh, an issue question about whether she supports choice or whether she supports, uh, whether she's a hawk on war. I think these things, does that affect women's choices in running for office and leadership? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, ex yeah, excellent, I absolutely. Although there is some change, we're seeing some change in men's investment in family and child care. And I can, Kathleen Gerson out of Princeton is a sociologist doing some wonderful research there on the balance of work and family. And this new book came out that showed that she interviewed a bunch of young people, 18 to 24, and men and women overwhelmingly are both wanting to have a family and career. So men are expressing, younger men are expressing interest in in children, but historically, absolutely, and still today, I mean, women have been wanted to and also have been expected to take care of family, and that takes up more time. Um, Arlie Hochschild is an, an amazing sociologist who talks about the second shift, and some of you might remember that book where, you know, both men and women are working in, you know, outside of the workplace first shift and then they come home and women still overwhelmingly do more of the housework and the child care and so she, she coined that the second shift and then some people um, have talked about a third shift you know when what happens when um, women are employed as care workers in homes and then they need to go home and take care of their own homes and their own kids you know so then that becomes the third shift but absolutely, there's a gender gap. Um, it's getting better. Statistics are showing it's getting better, and we might have like that experience on our own lives, where you know, so I know I ask my students all the time, well, how do you and your significant others negotiate household responsibilities, and what did your families do, and is it different, you know, and those sorts of things. But um, still, I think we can argue that women take women are responsible for more work. A lot of that is invisible, um, not paid, and um, should count towards the GDP, doesn't. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I don't know, I think we're gonna see some changes. So in, at least in my circle, sociologically, there's this great movement towards balance of work and family. Mm -hmm. That men and women, you know, looking at that and studying that and figuring that out, so that hopefully workplaces adopt those policies and make it easier for both men and women to care for families. That's really where the mood is. So when you're looking for jobs, I always encourage my students, consider workplace um, policies around family leave. Because some companies are better than others. That's a very, I just read an article about that this weekend, probably about the, the study you're talking about, where when you poll men and women, they pretty much agree we want to share the housework and raising the kids and so on. Everybody's, that was very different when I was younger and we were, you know. But um, today, the concept, the idea, the vision is we're going to share everything. But a lot of the family leave policies make it impossible for that to happen. And the women get the short end of the stick. Uh, just because of the way the family leave policies play out. So we haven't caught up. There are some countries in the world, I mean, the, you know, unfortunately the United States is like at the bottom of the barrel in this, in the civilized world, but there are many other developed countries where men and women get equal leave for caring for uh, children, and so you tag team it and, and, and that desire to sh share equally can uh, economically uh, and, um, and workforce-wise uh, work out. Um, but I will, answering uh, Merle's question, um, you know, there are a lot of phases in people's lives and a lot of opportunities that things are going to be different and are different for your generation than they were for mine. But, um, and everyone's circumstance is different, but in my circumstance, I could not have run for an elected office until my kids left for college. And you see, in my generation, a lot of women who are getting involved in the workforce, in uh, politics, and so on, who 
couldn't, for whatever reason, do it before. And uh, my issue was my husband is an urban planner. He has night meetings every night of the week. And that was the number one business, you know, breadwinning um, enterprise in the family. So I supported that and did my work at the UN and, and, and other things, but um, I could never have run for elected office because you have meetings at night, right, Alyssa? Alyssa, no, she goes to all the night meetings. And um, so I kept, I was asked, well, you're right, I can't, my kids are home, Tom's out every night of the week. So, but it was three weeks before our daughter left for college that I was asked again, will you run for, for council? And I said, yeah, oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And this person said, uh, you said that before, and you said you had to wait until your kids were in college. And isn't Annie <laughs> leaving for college in three weeks? This is what happens in a small town. But um, so what's your excuse now? And I, well, I'll think about it. But I was terrified that young man left. But um, basically, um, you know, you, you have to uh, sort of suck it up and, and be afraid to move forward. Being a, a woman in politics, when I think of um, women in politics, I think of Hillary Clinton, and I think of how when she when she went to run for office, she was referred to as strong, masculine, having the balls, and so when I think of women in power like that, they're often referred to as as traditional, having traditional masculine, uh, you know characteristics and features, you know, her wearing suits, um, having, really she still had short hair at the time. Um, do you do you experience that, or do you think that that's an issue in politics where a woman in with political power is, despite being a woman or being a self-identified woman, is referred to in terms of like a masculine, having masculine characteristics? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, we do. We've heard. We've heard that, and especially when you know Hillary was sort of new on the scene, and she was the most prominent woman who had run for president. And um, uh, but you don't hear people talking about her like that now. I mean, you there is there is um, a respect. I mean, you know, we we read and we hear and we see that she has. Uh, shown the world what she can do. She has utilized um, the left side of her brain, the right side of her brain, her feminist, uh, you know, uh, feminine qualities, masculine qualities that we all have. She was really able to pull it all together. Um, there's no question that for women who are strong and outspoken, really of any age, but particularly, you know, once you're not a child anymore. Um, if, if a man is outspoken and strong, you know, they're considered um, assertive and strong. And if a woman does that, sometimes she's considered aggressive and a bitch. And, um, you know, but I don't see that. I mean, that was a little bit more um, four years ago. <laughs> I mean, it's, things are changing rapidly. My opinion, and I, I think that you may, and things are changing a lot from when I was your age. Um, a lot of the young women today, you know, don't get up so so upset about the women's issues and you know the um, um, uh, equal rights and so on. They're like, what's the big deal? You know, like we've got it, and which is pretty terrific. Um, I know my daughter will say, like, what, you know, what's the problem, Mom? I mean, like, she's rocking out, you know? And she doesn't even think about it. And I say, hallelujah. But, um, but there are obviously still things that are going on and still people who are living in the dark ages who want to keep women in their place. But as we saw, a majority of women voted over men in the last election. And, um, there's a quote here by Bill Mayer. All the Republican men who talked about lady parts during the campaign, they all lost. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you can't do that anymore and get away with it. Or you can't do that anymore and still win. 
Um, and this last election was, uh, in my opinion, and I mean, not only in my opinion, um, a watershed moment for equality, for everyone. Uh, to tie into that, um, considering that women are now probably more influential than ever, being that they voted more than men, and we talked about some issues, um, I wanted to ask, and this ties into global feminism um, uh, discussion, are women becoming a more united voting bloc, or are they becoming more factional? I mean, over women's issues, over different, you know, areas, of whether it be South, North, or Republican, Democrat, are they becoming more, since 30, over 36% more voted for Obama, does that mean they're becoming more united, or are there still uh, big fractures and cracks in, you know, the overall voting bloc of women, since now they, they're basically the most important part, since they voted more? I think that women uh, do not all vote for the same reason. There are a lot of women who are one, there are a lot of voters who are one issue voters. You give me choice and I don't care what else they stand for, this is what somebody will say, I'm going to vote for that person, I don't care anything else about any other issue. But I don't, but there are so many different women's issues that you can't just say all women are voting as a block uh, because so many of them voted. There are issues uh, concerning uh, choice, as I mentioned. There are issues uh, financial, uh, even though for the most part I've, I've read that women do not necessarily vote their, uh, for financial, single women, I should say, uh, married women with children, of course, will probably take that more into consideration. But there are so many different issues, just like I think men vote for different issues as well. So uh, I don't think we can ever say that uh, women are voting as a, a, a block. I think uh, sm a smart politician will think about all of the issues that women are interested in. and. Uh, voters are interested in, and then they will either learn how to frame the issue so that they can attract more voters, uh, which is what some of the uh, parties are doing now. They're instead of changing the, their policies, they're trying to change the way they frame their issues so it sounds more palatable to the voter. So uh, I think a smart politician will just tell the truth, deal with as many issues as they can, focus on the people that, uh, that's, that are supporting them, and like I said, tell the truth. But women vote for so many different issues. Uh, young women, single women, uh, older women, professional women, there are different issues and different uh, demographics of uh, of women, so I don't I don't think we can say that at all. Like men, yeah. yeah. I, I just think the most important thing, as you already mentioned, Christian, I'm just uh, piggybacking on that in terms of the poli sci literature and, and uh, information from 2012 elections that show that really confirmed it's the gender gap in favor of the Democrats, in favor of a more liberal, equality leading set of policies um, that the party has represented over the years. Um, there is definitely a trend in the aggregate that direction. Um, and that was further seen through the support for Obama, as well as young people, actually. So contradicting again, the, those sampled on campus, um, youth and women turned out in hordes. Um, and the Republican Party is scrambling to try to figure out how to reach more women, uh, let alone you know minority folks. Um, gays, you know, and, and lesbians, the LGBT communities, um, I, I would say, um, you know, they've got the work cut out for them in terms of realizing that the Tea Party is become uh, a bit more of a detriment than a support in terms of getting the big, the big one. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate what both of you saying. You know, I, I, when I hear the phrase United Voting Block, I'm like, that must be a political science. 
to stand up and say, okay, it's enough. That's not okay. And I think that we saw that in this last election. But this is not new. Um, it's just a different era, and some of the issues, you know, of course, are different. But I thought that was pretty cool. Um, remember the ladies. <laughs> and, and, and I also, like, I, I, I'm very honored to tell you that Abigail Adams is my great aunt seven generations back. <laughs> Abigail, yeah. I'm very, very proud of her. <laughs> so I think about her a lot. What would she do? <laughs> Remember the ladies? Well, we have a little less than uh, 15 minutes left of footage, so um, do we have any questions, or I can get into another question myself. Um, Lisa, I'm really glad you brought up the transnational context of this, because I think that's something that we're really limiting our conversation by only talking about politics within like the U.S. state, and gaining power within the U.S. state, because um, even though a lot of women have gained power in the U.S. state, a lot of their policies that they're growing, uh, that they're supporting, um, at least in the uh, um, foreign policy realm, are really detrimental to third world women. And I think that's something that we really need to talk about, is talk about the politics of everyday life and the grassroots movements of politics. Um, because, you know, Hillary Clinton got brought up in um, she's been seen as a very powerful woman, but she also supports uh, policies within, um, with the IMF and supports policies against the Palestinians. And so what do feminist issues look like in Bolivia, in Palestine, Chile, Argentina, Chiapas? So I think that's Can I just say that I'm super proud because Nick is a women's and gender studies <laughs> student. <laughs> yes. Great question.
upon the populace and you know you just buy your votes and you know there's vote buying in any society in terms of if you want to get down to the nitty gritty about who comes out to vote and who doesn't you know um, what motivates people to decide to vote you know so um, I'm glad you brought that up just because it, it is something that I think is a bit remiss yet with um, uh, people who would consider themselves feminists uh, looking for equal rights for say that um, there are lots of different kinds of feminisms, right? which is what, what we've all been sort of saying that. And thinking about gender equity only is sort of, we have a tradition of that, we kind of call that liberal feminism. Um, but there is a really interesting uh, focus and literature and activism that we kind of name post-colonial feminism or transnational feminism. And, and I, it's, it's something that um, I, I we, can, we can shape issues using those perspectives, right? We can shape issues differently, you know? Um, so one way to do that is to think about the local conditions of wherever you're doing your work, like whether it's whatever country you're in or whatever community you're in or whatever city you're in, you're in that community doing work you, if you're an outsider coming in, you want to learn from those people, right? Um, that's a feminist perspective. You want to let those people tell you kind of what's going on. So, for example, Linda's right. You know, there, there's a there was a sort of a history, I guess, with the mainstream feminism in this country and in other Western countries, where we want, and we still do this sometimes, um, where we want to tell women how they should save themselves. And that's not the transnational feminist answer, right? And I think really where feminism is today, in, at least in my world, is thinking about you know, those sort of local communities and then connecting those to larger, broader issues, if you're talking about an issue. So I'm drawing on um, sociologists, feminist sociologists who study social movements. And there's a great book that talks about that by Nancy Naples and Manisha Desai, where they define transnational feminism as linking local through global, global ideas. So one way, one example of that is reproductive justice, right? So you know, maybe we don't talk about pro-choice or pro-life, because that's a real Western, or at least United States way of talking about um, women's rights to our own bodies. Maybe instead, we think about how family planning policies around the world are used as development initiatives and are not always in the best interests of the women in those developing nations. So um, maybe we think about how historically the birth control pill, for example, was tested before it was approved on women who had less power in developing nations. Maybe we think about forced sterilization. You know, we think about these issues under the umbrella of reproductive justice. That's sort of like the broader, quote unquote, global issue. But we get that information from talking and learning from feminists all around the world. And, and, and yes, there are feminists all around the world um, defining what that means for them. Justice, reproductive justice, and you know all of the justices are influenced by economic realities and economic development. And so I keep coming back to this thought. I mean, as as Hillary said, um, you know, in the beginning it was sort of like the right and virtuous thing to do that everyone is created equal. They are endowed by their creator. It's a, and all of that, that's virtuous. But there's also the economic piece of it. It's smart for everyone, not just women and men, but for all people, as you said, race, sexual orientation, uh, socioeconomic, you know, all, all of it, for there to be an, an equal opportunity because then you get the best of from every group. 
the best of, you know, in, in all the different um, capacities. So I think in terms of transnational feminism, and you link that to transnational economic development, um, that once people begin to see, you know, that one plus one equals more than two, um, when one and one are equal, then um, the types of justices that we're talking about will in fact become a part of <coughs> society because people will thrive economically and then quality of life and health and, and, and all of the ways that you know the, the economics of life supports us. So I think that's the key. And at, at the um, UN Conference on Population and Development, 1994, in Cairo, um, a new concept emerged, this very concept, that, hello, when you, studies were done, when you raise the status of women in some of these developing countries or any, any uh, community, when you raise the status of women, the education, their capacity to do work, make money, and so on, you raise the status and the, the quality of life of the entire community because it's the women who are generally in charge of educating the children, they raise all boats. And that was something new and everybody went, oh, hmm. So it's not just a good thing to do, it's not just the right thing to do, it really benefits everybody. I think that's, that is an awareness that we need to keep reminding ourselves of finding and, um, and and repeating because evidently it's true. <laughs> I think we also have to talk about reality here. I think we have to recognize the hypocrisy in uh, the way different countries uh, deal with each other, whether it's uh, economic issues or um, issues of national security. I think that none of the countries, unfortunately, are altruistic and going around the world thinking about what's good for women here and only that issue. I think, unfortunately, the most, the, the number one issue is uh, either financial or uh, just power. And when, when the United States, for example, tries to help developing countries, and develop and women in these countries, whether it's birth control or reproductive freedom or uh, uh, health care, I think they just that is not the number one issue. There's such hypocrisy that you can't, and I don't even understand it, and I don't know how we get away with so much hypocrisy that we can say, oh, we're so wonderful and we're doing good things around the world. Uh, so how do you weigh? You're doing good things here, but look at the terrible things that you're also doing in that country. So uh, it's, it's too complicated for me to understand, but I just am disgusted sometimes with the blatant hypocrisy that I hear. I hate to interrupt this wonderful conversation, but we are actually almost out of time. Um, so I would like to thank the panelists and the audience for all your questions. Uh, if you wish to you know, participate in the Political Science Club and you know, suggest events such as these or maybe participate, uh, definitely check out our meetings at 7.30 and 